Hi there, welcome along to Outdoor Gear Chat. We're on episode 28, and today we're talking mountain boots, good and stiff. So I'm joined by Cathy as always. Hi. Hi, Wayne. How are you doing? I'm, I'm all right. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Are you? Yeah, well, I'm improving. I've yeah, uh, yeah, managed I'm to say. kick the worst of COVID <laughs> out the full bucket. Of, <laughs> full of plague. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, no, definitely, definitely. <laughs> definitely improving uh i can't smell you and uh <laughs> but uh, otherwise all okay <laughs> that could, that's a good thing and and today we are joined by what do you you're going to do the introductions for us um, yes yes we have um a super special guest today actually um from uh, from the trade um mountain boots are a unbelievably technical product um when you sort of start talking to people in the know about what goes into making a good mountain boot it, it is mind-blowing so to come and give us a little bit of a, a look into that world we have scarpa uk's core sales director mr glenn padgett welcome glenn thank you kathy uh great to be here i'm not to be left out i am recovering from covid uh, <laughs> but um so I, I feel kind of inclusive now on this one but yeah. uh, yes thank you very much oh super duper um glenn before we start i am actually just going to pull in a little bit of scarpa history here because i know this is going to blow wayne's mind he loves stuff like this um, because uh, scarpa itself was uh, although it's obviously an Italian brand uh, as we know it, Scarpa is uh, actually an acronym for um, I'm not going to say it in Italian because my <laughs> my accent. Don't worry, boring. neither am I. I don't. <laughs> yeah. So it's for an acronym for the Association of Footwear Manufacturers from the mountain area of Asolo, which is a stunning, stunning part of Italy, which I know you've just literally come back from, Glyn. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, started by a landowner there who was a, a an Anglo in. Uh, Irish businessman, um, the second Earl of Ivy, who basically wanted to give work and uh, a future to the skilled craftsmen uh, of the area whose skills were leather processing. This gentleman was actually uh, owner and chairman of the family brewing business when he decided to set up Scarpa. And you might have heard of uh, <laughs> the you might have heard of him. His name was Rupert Edward Cecil Lee Guinness. <laughs> yep. Talented family, I hear. Very talented family. Yes. Mm -hmm. How random is that? <laughs> it, it's 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 incredible. They get everywhere, I think. Brewers or Irishmen, yeah. <laughs> both. <laughs> both, yeah. It is fantastic, isn't it? Sorry, I'm just, I've, I've just got lost in the website now, and we, 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 I think we better move on because I'm going to start asking questions about history. It's, but I, I guess it is fairly standard, isn't it? Like, like loads of landowners and our brewery owners back in the day were were responsible for for all sorts of innovation. It's absolutely in, in, incredible, really. So uh, yeah, so we, so we. we from the from those beginnings, you now expanded into all sorts of ranges, I guess, of, around footwear, predominantly. Absolutely. Originally, I mean, I think um, uh, Cecil was was very much interested in boots for war. Uh, mm -hmm. It was nineteen thirty eight at the time, so he was, and I think that region um, just north of Venice is a is a kind of very traditional boot making. Um, kind of area there's lots of companies making boots in that area and lots of companies uh, providing raw materials to those manufacturers and um, Scarpa have been pretty enduring I mean today it's exactly the same thing literally yesterday I left the factory and um, they're still making boots in exactly the same place drawing from raw materials from from the local producers it, it's it's built up in the same way that I guess Sheffield and steel and cutlery did do many years ago, but in Italy they've really kept that culture going, and um, and Scarpa is actually fairly unusual in that they're a manufacturer still. A lot of people have they farm out their manufacturing, mm. whereas these guys still make the vast majority of of their footwear. And is it, is it as, as Cathy was saying, the acronym originally came from a you know an association, to, for want yeah. of a better phrase. Then, so it is now our business. Is it with with drawing on the local community for its supply chain, basically? Abs absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I think um, whilst there's uh, there's an interesting sort of um, kind of view um, these days where we're sort of we've talked about globalization for a long time. Mm. Actually, we're moving back into an era where we make things more locally. 
Yeah, um, and that really suits Scarpa. And we're not making things thou tens of thousands of miles away. Yeah. Italy, um, uh, Azolo is is twelve hundred miles away. Um, yeah. It's a road, um, yeah. and um, and they're they're they're. Um, I mean, it's got its challenges, of course, making stuff in Europe at the moment. But uh, yeah. it, it's it's definitely um, something that is going to occur more and more in the future. Yeah, and I think we've spoken about that before, Cathy, haven't we, along the lines of sustainability and businesses Ooh. like that. Your, yours, Glyn, is a, is a prime example of that, really, that they're, they're looking to use products from, yeah, from that hasn't had to travel very far and then doesn't have to travel much further to, to get to the market that it's, that it, that it's supplying, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. if you think yeah, it's prime, yeah. I mean, this, this topic of mountain boots, the Cortina um, in the Dolomites is is an hour and a half away from the factory. Uh, and, and I think you'll find a lot of other... Uh, mountain boot companies, companies making uh, boots um, around the kind of fringes of the Alps as well. So um, um, it, it's definitely that uh, uh, short distance. Brilliant. So, so yeah, and, and we, we mentioned the words a few times now, but the, the, I guess this episode is about mountain boots rather than the other footwear lines of which you've got, you've got quite a few, obviously. Um, but yeah, so just so that I, I am I'm blissfully unaware, to be honest, of, of, of a great deal involved in, involved in mountain boots. So why, why, what, how, how does it differ from a walking boot or a hiking boot as the more commonly termed at the moment? I wonder if um, I just jump here, Glyn, if uh, jump in, Glyn, if that's okay, and just explain mm -hmm. um, what um, is has been kind of introduced over the years as a B B one and a, a, a B two and a B three boot, which a lot of customers will see in the shops, um, and it might not be immediately clear what that means and how it might correlate to a C one, C two, C three crampon. So the whole kind of mountain boot category is very very broad and um, you can get a flexible mountain boot through to a very stiff mountain boot um, so uh, this sort of b1 b2 b3 is a way of explaining that simply for, for people to understand um, so a b1 would be suitable for sort of summer hill walking and scrambling um, but it is stiff enough to take a flexible cramp on for short glacier crossings um, maybe the odd winter hill walking day um, but there's not much insulation in a in a b1 boot a b2 would be perhaps suitable more for summer alpine climbing uk winter walking a slightly stiffer sole unit um, with a little bit more insulation and a b3 well that's as stiff as you can get um, so a super stiff sole so you've got a platform basically to support your feet and your legs when you're front pointing into steep ground that can take a step in strapping system on a, a crampon and um, that perhaps provides the most insulation for warmer feet in winter and your b1 boot will take a c1 crampon your b2 boot will take a B c2 crampon sorry and your b3 boot will take a c3 crampon so it's a, an easy way of understanding the stiffness of a boot and also perhaps to identify what you're going to need as well Cathy, I think uh, it's uh, for me, I think the, the, the sort of definition of a mountain boot is, as you've just said there, anything really you can put a crampon on. Uh, and as you say, that varies from something that you could walk around the fells in in the winter to an 8000 meter boot. Um, but ultimately, if it will, if it will, you can attach safely and securely a crampon, then it, it's, it's a mountain boot. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And the reason why that sort of stiffness has to be there, even when you're talking about flexible boot and flexible crampon, um, if you imagine your foot is a, a sack of bones with ligaments and muscles it's very very flexible it has to be to, to, to hold us up and to go over um, uneven terrain once you wrap a, a boot around that the boot is less flexible than your foot but it still needs to move with your foot um, so you will see a flex around the toe area a crampon being made entirely of metal is substantially less flexible than a leather boot if you like uh, or a fabric boot if you imagine something being attached to something and one is less flexible than the other something's going to give that's going to be a crampon that falls off and that's something that you do not want happening um in a, a slippery environment <laughs> 
I, I think thankfully, I certainly remember days when certain boots would fit certain crampons. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was it was almost a dark art. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was uh, sort of a raised eyebrow from the retailer when you tried to combine one crampon with one boot. Thankfully, today, I think modern technology means pretty much every crampon of the right grade will fit the right boot. Um, and uh, and the kind of the days of uh, trying to modify crampons or even boots to, to make them work together as, as, as thankfully gone. And, um, and, and the attachments now are, are much better than they, they've ever been. Yeah, and I suppose one other last thing that, that can make a difference there is a, the same crampon and the same boot in a size three, for example, um, may fit quite differently to the same crampon and the same boot in a size 13. Um, so if you are fitting um, boots to crampons, it is always worth just uh, making sure that they're working well, even with a, a bigger boot, it's obviously going to flex more. Sometimes you need to change that up a bit as well. And that's where sort of experience comes in and having a chat with um, shop staff. Definitely, this isn't something you can pick up if you're buying online, for example. You do need to have a chat mm. with people in person about that. And you can, you know, a lot of staff be happy to take the time with you and show you exactly why you're saying, well, this one is going to work better than this because maybe the profile fits similarly um, or the width works better. You know, there's lots of things to take into account. It's not just to chuck it on and off we go um, all, all the time. But as you say, Glenn, it's a lot easier than it was back in the old days. A absolutely. And I think I'd, I'd probably add into you're in a winter environment. Um, you've got more stuff. It's not you're not wearing shorts and uh, a T-shirt and uh, uh, a kind of running pack. You've got a, a you'll have a day pack. It, it's likely to be 30, 40 litres. You'll have flasks. You'll have spare clothing. Um, I think it's a very valid, it's super valid point, Cathy, that um, you've got to understand that you're, you're probably weighing 20 to 25 kilos more than you would traditionally do because of the clothing and the equipment that you're taking out into that that winter environment. And uh, of course, that will have an effect on 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 your on your footwear. And then you, we just we talked up and a couple of times within the conversation there about warmth and and uh, as of the boots as well and obviously we're going out we're talking about mountaineering boots win, winter boots essentially then yeah how what how how does the warmth work in those is are they you know the uh, and again speaking as a, an absolute novice if if that how is are they fleece lined or anything do you want me to go on that one, Cathy? Uh, yeah, you definitely go on that, Glenn, because you've got all the technical speak on that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm not sure it's that techy, but uh, here we go. Um, so I would say, I mean, as, as Cathy did explain, a, a winter walking boot, a B1 boot, generally won't have insulation in it at all um, because you want to use that four seasons of the year. So it will it may be made out of, uh, of thicker materials, which will add a, a level of warmth, but it, it won't have any added insulation because you want to use that in the summer as much as you want to use it in the winter. Um, it's when you get into the B2 and the B3 categories, and more recently we're starting to see Gore-Tex liners with an added layer of insulation, maybe in a B2 boot, um, and, and that will boost the warmth a bit. Um, it, it's obviously it's it's not a super thick line liner, um, but uh, and and so can add a, a level of warmth, but it's not huge. I think it's when you get into the more the sort of B three boots that you've got all sorts of different levels of of insulation, um, from a simple liner through to a separate booty um, that you can take out. So if you look at boots that you might use at high altitude, really from about four or five thousand meters upwards, you'll find that a lot of these boots have got a separate insulated booty within the outer uh, of, the, of the boot. And this can be removed because, of course, you might want to put that into the sleeping bag if you're overnight, to keep it warm, stop it from freezing uh, and to dry it out if it's got wet through the day. What was interesting was we were talking we were talking about with um katrina who's Actually, with yeah, the british antarctic antarctic yeah. Ant Ant survey and she said exactly that she was she 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 takes them out to dry them out overnight sticks them in a sleeping bag and you just mentioned gore there as far as a, a, a membrane so does that offer insulation as well as being waterproof and is it yeah you've got other i guess you've got other waterproof membranes within your boot as well 
Certainly adding a waterproof membrane to a boot will add um, a level of warmth. Uh, just because, I mean, the more breathable a boot is, the co cooler it will be. Um, and um, so actually adding a waterproof layer, Gore is simply probably the best known of them, but there mm, are others yeah. on the market. <laughs> um, uh, it, it does add a, a layer of, of, of insulation itself because it's whilst it's breathable, it's only so breathable. So there's a level of, there's an extra there. But um, certainly Gore do an insulated um, gore liner and that has a few millimeters of extra insulation that's next to the Gore-Tex, next to the membrane. Um, so it adds um, that extra layer. So we have uh, the most recent product that we've added this to is, is the Manta. So the Manta has been around for a long time. We've always wanted it uh, in terms of its usage to climb Mont Blanc. We kind of, when we, when we move that model and generate a new one, we always have that in our mind, Mont Blanc. Can we summit Mont Blanc with the Manta? Um, and uh, Mont Blanc's a bit tricky because it's 4,800 metres. It's not It's not a, just 4,000. And um, we've recently added the gore insulated membrane to that just to make sure that if somebody wanted to climb Mont Blanc, then that boot was uh, is, is it's within its comfort zone. Oh, that's a great, great addition, um, because uh, also there's its sort of insulation underfoot as well. That makes a big difference to how warm a, a boot is, isn't it, doesn't it? And um, like one of the keys I've found on expeditions in particular, I suppose this was more my last sort of big Himalayan expedition was in was with double plastic boots. So uh, so there's a lot less forgiveness with those. But if your boot doesn't actually fit, if you're going to altitude, if you're going up Mont Blanc, if you're going higher than um, 4,000 metres, 4,800, five and above, um, you need to be absolutely sure the fit of that boot is correct as well. Because as your feet swell, if there's any constriction, um, then uh, and, and any, any sort of pushing down, that is going to affect your blood flow, which will already be sluggish naturally at altitude anyway um, and we definitely don't want that compounding any issues with um, losing feeling in your toes and uh, and frost nip and, and frostbite etc etc so fit is is absolutely critical as well to keeping your feet as warm as possible when they're frankly buried under snow in the darkness for the first few hours of your day as you're trudging uphill into daylight uh, and that's where your food and your drink comes in as well eating properly and hydrating properly that's the only way that you can create your fuel that is the fuel you need to keep your body warm and how how do you how do you mimic that that swelling of your feet at altitude then how would, is it is it just you know when you're trying them on um is it is it sticking extra socks on is it as simple <laughs> as that or is it have you just got to give them a try and say well they are going to give it you know they are going to your feet are going to swell a little bit i think um i mean as, as kathy said earlier i think the key the key thing in these all of these um examples is uh you really need to try these things on yeah. uh you need to be in a store and you need to have someone <clears throat> who understands and um, uh, is knowledgeable on these matters, we would say that, um, uh, if you like, Mont Blanc's a good good sort of standard. If beyond that, I think, as Cathy said there, you start to need to think, start thinking about your foot changing shape, as your foot mm. swelling. Um, manufacturers, and I think most manufacturers, uh, certainly we do at Scarpa, is we alter the last the shape of the boot. So if you take our Phantom Tech model, which is designed for technical climbing, we have a very close fit, but you wouldn't be using that at altitude and you might use it in Scotland. It's warm enough for Scotland, but you wouldn't use it at, at 5,000 meters maybe. Our 6,000 meter boot opens up the last slightly because now we're going to start seeing your foot change shape, your foot swell at altitude. And, uh, and then if you take that to the, to the end point the 8000 meter boot we the fit is i'll get into trouble for this it's almost a boat it's huge <laughs> because yeah. your foot will change enormously yeah. um and those can be quite tricky to fit because at sea level they might not feel like they fit uh, they really only come into their own at higher altitudes yeah. as, as your foot changes and um, why why I'm just having a quick look on the website seeing that the 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 quite high the boots and why 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 is why is that you know you, I mean particularly the ones that you were just talking about at the end there the phantoms are you know re, re, really high uh, you know over the ankle but the is it what is there a reason of, of having having them a bit higher up over the ankle 
in the end, it's insulation and protection. Um, so we're, we're very much uh, aware that you might be in deep snow. So uh, to your point, I think you're talking about the sort of gaiter um, yeah. that comes up from the boot. Um, and, uh, and that has a layer of insulation on the back of the gaiter, but also is, is designed to sort of fit very snugly with maybe a down suit, even if you're climbing a, a high mountain um, uh, above 7,000 meters. And um, so you, you'll tuck your down suit into that. But if you're wading in deep snow, breaking path, then the snow's uh, not going to get into the boot. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as soon as it gets into the boot, um, it creates uh, water inside inside your footwear. And and that can be, well, dis disastrous. At, yeah, at yeah. Altitude. On all sorts of levels. Yeah, I've, I've had that a number of times, just where, where snow's fallen over the, you know, over the tongue of, of the boot in, in, and, and then gone down there and, and balled up, basically. And then, like you say, slowly it's seeping down the front of your foot. And it's just, and that was just on the fells in the Lake District. Yeah. So. Yeah, in the winter in the lakes and in Scotland, you get those little golf balls. They get super hard, yeah. actually. Some of those yeah. um, balls of snow, don't they? And and gators are by far and away the the simplest and, and most cost effective solution to make sure that doesn't happen. And you can keep your socks as dry as you possibly can, and uh, and that can make a really really big difference to, to to your enjoyment of the day, basically. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a great way of looking at it in that uh, you can have the most waterproof boot in the world, but there's a giant <laughs> hole in the top of it. Yeah, yeah. That's it. It's only waterproof to the top, basically, isn't exactly. it? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's it. And then once stuff starts getting down, it's going to be, yeah, it can, it can be disastrous, I guess, it's, it, like, as, as you said. So, yeah, so I'm, I've, I've, got, I've got a load of questions that come on, follow on, uh, on sustainability as well, because I know you, you were talking earlier on, and Cathy mentioned briefly in the introduction about um, how the, the, the business was developed from local leather, leather making boots, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and in, in, in the world where we how it's moving is from a sustainability perspective, from a environmental perspective, from a, a customer perspective. That's you know that there's there's a, there's a switch away from leather um, in 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 a number of different industries, I guess. But you're 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 seeing an impact of that as well, and have made some changes, I guess, have you? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the key thing um, from 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 Scarpa's point of view, um, and uh, th those guys um, are currently, uh, Scarpa are currently in the process of getting their uh, B Corp certificate oh, wow. um, uh, as an overall sort of business. I mean, and very, I mean, a hugely challenging sort of, uh, sort of certification to achieve. Um, I think there's something, there's only something like 5,000 companies in the world that have that certificate. And, um, it's it's a tool to I suppose for Scarpa to to get this vision that every part of the business is is as sustainable and and socially aware as well as they possibly can, and um, part of that is very much started when um, I mean we talk about Cecil Ivy uh, starting the business, but uh, if you go back. Uh, I think it was 1956, um, um, the Paris Otto brothers bought the business. And at that point, uh, Scarpa sort of say that their sustainable story started mm. um, because they started to make products that last. Uh, they last a long time. And then crucially, and I think this is a really important point, particularly with mountain boots, because there are no exceptions with mountain boots. Mountain boots cost a lot of money. We can't get away from that. Um, but the process that, that the, the way that they're made means that they can be resold and repaired um, very well, relatively easily. Um, uh, they are substantial enough that you don't throw them away uh, when you've worn the sole out or you've damaged them or you've broken a zip we can fix and repair those things. Um, Scarpa certainly have been working very hard um, to creating a sort of a, a sustainable reselling service. So the boots can literally go back to Italy. It's not a million miles away and be repaired and, and fixed and, and refurbed even uh, by um, the people who built them in the first place. It, that's, that's the ultimate uh, sort of service really. Yeah, Absolutely love yeah. that. Yeah, I know, Cathy, you and I have spoken very briefly about that story before, haven't we? It's just fantastic, yeah. 
Yeah, you have in the, and I think the key is you said they can be refurbished because the people with the skills and the tools are there. It's the, the boots going back to their birthplace, basically, aren't they, <laughs> to be given a new lease of life. And uh, and this this is something we used to see with a, with a lot of equipment, sort of thirty years ago when I sort of started out in retail and, and products were made in Britain. You'd have customers bring in products. You'd just look at it and go, "Oh my word!" You know, <laughs> I'm not sure what they can do, but let's try. And you'd send it back and that customers would be over the moon because this mm. just beautiful product would be returned, just literally refurbished is absolutely the best word. It hadn't just been repaired. It had been lovingly re repaired. And mm. uh, and that's something that has just diminished as, as uh, all manufacturing, or not all manufacturing, but the vast majority of manufacturing has been shipped halfway around the planet. It's been lost. And I think that's a real bonus and and something that that should be celebrated and i think it's really important for us as retailers to point that out as well because as you said glenn mountain boots just by design they are expensive they're massively they're massively critical piece of technical equipment for us to go to zones of the world where humans shouldn't exist and to come back with all of our 10 toes ideally so modern mountaineering boots can be anything up to 800 to 900 pounds a pair that's a huge investment but if you have then got like multiple trips out of those boots, um, then that's when they start becoming, that's your added value, isn't it? Um, and being able to, you, you're not going to have to buy a new pair, you can just send them away. Um, there perhaps may be a cost involved in getting them refurbished, but that's going to be over a longer term period, that's going to be so much more of a better investment than getting a cheaper pair that are just um, going to end up in landfill that much sooner. I, I have a fantastic story where um, we had a chap send a pair of mountain boots, um, leather mountain boots um, from, I would, I would guess they were probably about 15 years old. And I don't think this was the first resole they'd had as well. So this guy was very active in Scotland in the winter and um, I was in our office and these boots came back and they were, they were incredible. Um, whilst they'd had, they'd been resold, re -randered. There was a new footbed, new laces this guy's boots had almost visibly their life in the boot. It had all the lumps, <laughs> bumps, scrapes. He clearly looked after his boots uh, and uh, it, it was just incredible. And uh, I, I perhaps wrongly tried to say, look, I'd love to have his boots for a clinic just to explain <laughs> to more people how we can fix these things. And he quite rightly came back to me and said, no money on earth would, <laughs> would make me swap these boots. That's part of the team, aren't they? They are, yeah. you know, they, they are. But like we, we've, talk, we've spoken about all sorts of bits of kit that we use, about it from jackets to rucksacks Absolutely. that become, they, they are, they've got so many, many stories within them, haven't they? You've shared so many experiences, yeah. Yeah, they're like old friends. And, and mm. we have so many customers come in, and me included, actually, when it comes to, I've got to get, you know, I've got to get a new pair of mountaineering boots. So my old ones, my foot has changed shapes so much through running they don't fit anymore so uh, we've still got life in them they'll get passed on to somebody else but it's it's taken me a ridiculous amount of time to even get to the point where I can consider trying new ones on <laughs> and then, and this is something that when we're talking with customers a lot of them are feeling the same thing they're like oh I know these have worked for me for years I'm really reluctant I'm nervous about buying a new pair of boots because if I get it wrong you know and that's where we say well just take time come in if you've just come in and it's five minutes to closing and you're telling me that you want to try on new boots we're probably going to say we're not going to serve you because yeah, you need to come in with a good few hours bring your socks um we've got packs you can try with weight on you can go up and down stairs we've got a lovely uh scarpa uh, incline in the shop people can go up and down and make sure they get absolutely the right fit for them and sometimes they come back two or three times to make make sure they've made the right choice and there's nothing wrong with that at all um, it's really, really important. If you're up on holiday for a week, you know, just take take your time. Um, so we we sp we've just spoken about the you know the 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 not not end of life, the refurb almost, the re <laughs> the re the resurrection of our boots. But how how do, how do we look after them on an ongoing basis? Just to you know, how, what what sort of care do we need to be taking o o over them as as we're wearing them? I think that um, leather boots. I mean, obviously, leather boots um, need to be cared for. You, the, if you buy a leather mountaineering boot, then um, it's important that you you understand. And again, I think this is where you ask um, the guys in the shop um, the best 
the, the best care and, and treatments that you can apply and uh, a good shop will have a good selection of different care products. So you will need to um, re-wax the, the leather boots just to put um, an element of waterproofing and, and essential oils back into the leather as, as they leach out over time. The winter environment is in, incredibly harsh. Um, so um, it, it will it will take its toll on, on a boot. And so um, generally the waxes and, and all I can really say on there is just don't apply too much. Um, <laughs> make sure it's well rubbed into the boot you almost want a shiny surface uh, on the boot so that water would bead up and roll off we see too many boots almost cared for too much too much wax sitting on the top of, uh, of, of the boot and it's it's not good for the boot at all on the synthetics um, so as you get into the higher altitude boots, it's making sure that the silicon treatment that's on the surface, so the water repellency of those boots is up to scratch. I mean, Kathy might have some some examples of good treatments that you can put on those boots to um, uh, keep them water repellent. In terms of materials, you, they're generally pretty solid themselves, but I think certainly uh, improving that that water repellency is is a good idea. Yeah, Nick Wax and, and Grangers do um, specific products um, absolutely for that for that very use. And I suppose if you've got uh, high altitude boots with, with gaiters as well, there's maybe an element of just checking zips, making sure they're not full of grit and uh, making sure they're running because... Um, uh, if if you're using your boots at altitude or even on, like on a regular Scottish winter weather misery fest, you know, if, if your zips aren't working properly, you've got big bulky gloves on, the wind's blowing a hoolie, you just, uh, it, 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 yeah, you, you, the last thing you want to do is get the ump with your zip, force it, and then the tab, <coughs> something happens that was your fault. Um, it's uh, making sure everything just works properly before you actually get out and about uh, is, is definitely the way forward. I'm saying this <laughs> as somebody who doesn't always <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> Kathy, I think that's a great point. I mean, the biggest problem we see with zip boots is them not being well lubricated. They, they, we we off, we'll put some lubrication in the box. Yeah. Um, and um, as they dry out, they will become, they will stick more. And as you say, uh, are prone to breaking if you force that. Keeping your zips on those those more specialist products. I mean, they're, they're relatively uh, sort of all in the high altitude realm, but um, um, but definitely that's that's a, a major issue is 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 looking after the zips. Yeah, um, and if your zip lube runs out, what what is the best kind of lubricant to use, Glyn? I mean, we have spares on that um, oh, at okay. the Mountain Boot Company, so yeah. we can replenish that. I mean, essentially, it's a silicon lube. Yeah. Um, and um, I can probably uh, uh, supply you with some names and things like that uh, for the podcast after the podcast. Sort of thing. <laughs> no problem. Well, we've knows. probably got um, spares already in our uh, uh, in in our return section. Actually, uh, now now you've said that, we've, I think I have seen them. So um, yeah, if people do have issues with their zips and, and need. <laughs> If people need to come to us for more lubricant, we have it. <laughs> <laughs> the stockists of lube. Um, we, we, we've got a matter of minutes left on, 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 on today. So I guess the, what, the, just the one, the one thing, Glyn, that I wanted to add into the sort of sustainability, the Green Manifesto stuff, which I don't, I don't think you mentioned specifically the words, was the vegan-friendly boot range that, that that's now available as well from Scarpa. But what, yeah, what's different from from other 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 boots that you've got? So, I mean, obviously, a leather boot by its very nature is uh, is part animal. Um, mm. uh, but any of the synthetic mountaineering boots, and there are quite a lot of them. So, um, for a manta is 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 leather, for instance. But we also have something called a charmeau, uh, which is 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 synthetic. And and these days we're also using synthetic glues. That was the biggest issue. Mm. So whilst we're using synthetic fabrics, man-made fabrics, we're now using the glues. Those are now good enough to be strong enough to hold the boot together through those sorts of stresses and strains. And I just got to point out while Glyn was in the shop just recently, I did have a question about this and I asked him and he came back with that answer exactly, which is like perfect. And he said, ah, now also um, I can confirm that that particular style is used with a synthetic brush, not a pig's hair brush. <laughs> I was just like, now that is the ultimate answer. I went back to the customer and they were just like, their jaw was on the floor. It's like, seriously 
like, yep, yeah, you. Amazing. <laughs> That's how much detail goes into these things. <laughs> Man's technology has taken a long time to cope uh, to produce a brush that is as good as a boar's hair's brush <laughs> for applying glue. <laughs> That's how far we've come. <laughs> amazing brilliant so i think we'll we'll, we'll end on that on that note on with the boar's hair brush <laughs> and no, no hair brush and lubricant <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> so thanks for joining us glenn that has been episode 28 where we've been talking about mountain boots that was good and stiff um so yeah that, that's been outdoor gear chat and we'll, we'll be back soon yeah, you can find out more at uh, our uh, retail website, which is www.climbers-shop.com. And there's also a wealth of information, including uh, a link to all of Scarpa's technologies on our Joe Brown Outdoor Academy website, which is www.joebrownoutdooracademy.com.